notch come up to its full horsepower. But you, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've been That's what it says in the that. book. I have been criticized. <laughs> going to college and this came up as a summer job. This was going to be my summer job, but I just stayed because it was fun. <laughs> Get some royalties on this documentary. I'm sure you'll make lots of money on this. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> I guess I'll never live that down. <laughs> I'm probably the finest locomotive engineer in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> I, I always liked that. Larry dated, I, I had three roommates. Larry dated all three of them. I was number four. <laughs> and this was back in New York when he was a, um, uh, in the Air Force. He was a, um, um, he, he worked, he did line work in the military. We met in, um, like, November, I believe, and got engaged in December, and we got married the following August. So, less than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he went to work for um, a telephone company. Okay, in the beginning. And then he was just, he went to school, you know, he started school. And then he got the job at the railroad. And then school, um, that worked out well because uh, he got cut off in the wintertime, went to school, worked in the summertime. But then Deborah was expecting, and so then he got on full time at the railroad. I do remember growing up in, in the valley where everyone worked at the lab and everyone's dad was an engineer. I thought that was pretty neat that everybody's dad drove a train. I didn't understand that there was electrical engineers and uh, chemical engineers. I thought that everything was a locomotive engineer. He did have, what we liked is like he could call in, lay off, and we could go places. That was good. You know, he could take a week off here, a week, well, not, not always a week, but days here, days there, you know. He took me fishing, and I got a, a, the hook stuck in my hair, 
And then another time we went fishing, uh, there were a bunch of yellow jackets, so I stayed in the car. Dad did a lot of stuff. So he took me swimming all the time, and he let me drive down Stanley, sitting on his car, on his lap in the car. And um, he just he did the best that he could when he was home. When I first met him, and uh, we had this job. Went to work at 10.30 in the morning, and about 1, 1.30, we were through with the morning's work, and we used to have to wait for a Swiss list, maybe two, three hours, and we'd go over to Galbraith Golf Course and play nine holes. And <laughs> that was our lunch. We'd have a sandwich and play and eat at the same time, you know? That was fondest memories. It was great, lots of fun. About 15 years ago, uh, when I was doing Let's Talk Sports, we did a lot of what we call inside production in the studio. And um, Larry volunteered as a, as a camera person. So from that point on, I called him Cameraman Larry. And uh, then he went with me on numerous shoots uh, and uh, actually uh, did a great job and was there for uh, maybe four or five years. And that's how our friendship started. Let's see, it was uh, right out of, uh, actually it was in training. Uh, I was in, uh conductor school and I had a week stint on the uh, 54 local and I had met Larry and uh, Frank Camp and uh, I was a student on their, uh, their particular job and uh, I think it was love at first sight. I just uh, I enjoyed being around Larry, enjoyed being around Frank and they were tremendous mentors to me. Uh, they had that positive outlook as far as uh, mentoring and, and experiencing and, and wanting to sit down and take the time to take a new uh, buck underneath their wings and, and show them the ropes and, and they were very open to that and that was my first I would have to say positive experience and, and what drew me to them uh, it was kind of a two-way street there but uh, that was a very favorable uh, time on the 54 local there right in the conductors realm there learning the ropes and then having the patience and time to, to teach you and uh, make it enjoyable as well. That was uh, wonderful to have that uh, opportunity with Larry and, and Frank. And one of the things that you have on the railroad is your reputation. And the railroad, uh, people always joke that, uh, you know, something can happen uh, in San Luis Obispo in the morning and the word will be in Roseville by lunch. And so your reputation pretty well goes around. And Larry had a reputation of being an okay guy, a good engineer, uh, and, and so you just kind of gravitate to people like that whenever you can to work together. Uh, and like I say, the reputation uh, precedes you in many cases uh, when you get somewhere. Oh, well, I've known Larry over the years. We've, uh, he's been an engineer. We'd stumble into each other and then <clears throat> we'd work regular jobs together. He'd go his way, I'd go my way, then we'd bump into each other again. The last time was when him and uh, Dick Leitner convinced me to change from Warm Springs to Milpitas to work with them on the uh, 46 local. And we worked that for about eight, six months before Larry went back to Milpitas and then Dick got injured and so there I am in a strange yard all by myself and the people I was gonna work with are gone. So uh, we got along pretty good and while I was there after being on the railroad for a lot of years, Larry gave me my nickname that I've never had before on the railroad. I came to work with a cold and giving him radio commands, he started calling me Froggy. And uh, lo and behold, the name did stick after all these years, so now a lot of people call me Froggy. <laughs> the previous hog head we had on there who was WP and I've known him ever since we've been down here. Uh, a nice guy and all, but he would make life difficult for the 54 local, primarily because he wanted to go home before he even got there to go to work. And then he would just poke around, and even if you were able to try to get the work done, uh, it was battling him all day. Larry came on the job, and Larry, you know, likes to do a good job too, and, and we just worked well together. We, we became good friends. Frank Camp was, was on here, uh, the three of us, and, and Frank has known uh, Larry for many years. But uh, 
as one of the WP people, uh, they kind of took me in, in their arms and embraced me, so, which is good because there wasn't too many of us left. <laughs> well, we always had a little joke between the two of us, and I'm junior, and there was a Paul Sr. and there was a Paul Jr., and uh, I was a junior, and um, we've always kept that up. Every time we see each other on the coming by, we always say, hey, junior. That was us. <laughs> well, Larry and I always uh, had, a, had a thing going that uh, we enjoyed pulling kind of a prank on each other uh, whenever possible. We always, almost always worked nights. Either the afternoon job ended up being nights or strictly nights all night long. And uh, I had a thing that I used to get to him because your, your night vision, like looking at this light right here, you know, what it does to you, uh, as opposed to being out there in the dark where you can see better. And uh, I, I used to take delight in uh, getting over some place where he didn't know I was going to be coming and maybe he was coming by on the train uh, slowly through the yard or something and I would shine my spot bulb in his eyes you know and, he just, and he'd yell out oh you got me you know and, and then later he'd do the same to me with his flashlight or the headlight of the engine and things like that that was uh, always a good good sense of humor and always he was prepared to to go to work and uh, as well as as Tom and you know the guys were on time they were they, they came down with the, not just trying to get out of work, but just trying to get the work done as efficiently and fast as possible. And uh, they had good attitudes and, and good senses of humor. Because I went hungry a lot of times because I'd bring enough for me. And you get on the engine and Larry with these little puppy dog eyes over there would, would keep giving you the eye until you shared your lunch with him. But uh, he's uh, all in all a pretty good guy to work with. We had a lot of fun got along good and made the time go fast. I, I think one of the funniest memories I have of, of um, uh, Larry, uh, we were uh, train building in uh, Warm Springs there in the upper yard. We had just completed um, uh, building our train. We were shoving back into the upper yard and Santa Fe was going to do the same thing on the adjacent track there and uh, over my shoulder there the uh, crew of managers were watching us. They were watching us build our train. That was what we call the swarm team. Uh, and uh, we just finished the, uh, the switch and the train building and I had my uh, brakeman get on the point and shove back in, which is a, a proper movement uh, for protecting the point as you're, you're shoving back into a, a blind rail. And uh, the Santa Fe conductor came over and stood back next to me and he was gonna do the same thing. Uh, however, he didn't. He, he didn't get his brakeman on and he didn't get on the uh, point shoved right back into the rail adjacent to us. And the next thing I know, I look over my shoulder and the, the blazer full of managers is taking off and they're heading towards us. I didn't know what basically they were after, but boy, they, they shot like a rocket after us. And uh, pulled up alongside of us. And uh, I don't know if you, uh, the analogy of a, you've been to the circus where one of those uh, little clown cars pulls up and all the doors open up and all of a sudden these people just start piling out. So they piled out and they surrounded this uh, conductor on the uh, BNSF and I kind of stepped back a little bit but they actually uh, cited him for not uh, protecting his shove. He didn't get on the uh, point or nor did he uh, elect to have his brakeman get on there so uh, they started a pretty stiff argument there so I just kind of stepped back and, and uh, went back towards the engine there where Larry was sitting but as soon as I got up on there he uh, he was laughing. He says, you ever seen that? He says, just like a clown car pulling up at the circus there. All the and he was laughing his head off there. And uh, that was probably one of the mem more memorable moments uh, that I had with uh, Larry. Larry and I uh, soon developed a friendship, and we're both bachelors. And so, uh, as uh, I don't know who came up with this term, it's either there's only two of us, either he or I. Uh, we used to like to go out and ramble every once in a while. And uh, so we used to go uh, to our couple favorite, uh, quote unquote, restaurant watering holes. And uh, he's single and I'm single. And uh, so we, we, would, uh, we would have a good time together. And, uh, uh, and we, we were always uh, well behaved, except a few times uh, where we got rides home. Uh, but, uh, and then once in a while, when the hot rods had come, we'd ride in Larry's Corvette. That was a big, that was, that was big time for me. I, you know, that's, that's a big time. And uh, he would, uh, you know, he would drive one time and I'd drive. And of course, when I drove, it was always an adventure uh, because he's, uh, he, I'm sure he was a little nervous when I was driving. Uh, actually, Larry is famous for helping me out trying to meet these young ladies. Um, it was the first Wednesday one night, 
and uh, it was about uh, 6.30, and I met uh, three very nice young ladies on the first Wednesday, and I'm talking to them, and uh, they can hear the train coming, and it's right about uh, the corner of Maine and uh, Stanley, and it's coming very slow. And I said, oh, ladies, that's my friend, Larry the engineer, and they laughed. I said, well, you wanna hear something? I said, I'll call him right now, and uh, let's see, there are three of you. I said, he'll toot three times. So I called him on his cell phone, he said, yeah, I'm coming right there. I said, when you get to Rose Avenue, toot three times. So these ladies didn't know who I was, and they thought I was just, not, you know, kidding around. And he got to Rose Avenue, and he tooted three times. And those ladies were very pleased with me. And I have to thank Cameraman Larry for that, and Engineer Larry. So, yeah, he, uh, that's, that's, those are the kind of things we did, you know. Well, that's, that's funny. I, I, I'm just going to hold this up to the camera. See, I have this thing called a time book that I did some... Uh, homework on and uh, uh, you know we went out to uh, there was a trip on February 24th 1978 and uh, this was just after I got back from the simulator and I w went back to the fireman's job and uh, we went out to Tracy and uh, it was the SFWCY and we had the 8474 and the 8986 and we tied up at 8:15 uh, p.m. and uh, what do we have on duty? Not a bad trip. We had uh, we're on duty at 3.15 in the afternoon at five hours and 30 minutes on duty. And 8.15 p.m., I think that was really prime time to go to the bar and get a drink before they closed at 2 a.m. And I don't, um, I think that I was really tired that day because I had a, a long day the day before and uh, I went to the hotel and I sacked out. and. Uh, uh, I don't know what Larry did. It, um, I have no idea what Larry did, but I think he went over and, and uh, I think he had a toddy or two. And uh, our conductor was Roy Smith, and Roy always likes someone to go have a little toddy with him after work, and I think Larry might have been with Roy. I'm not sure, but maybe. I wasn't there. I don't know. But the next day on the 25th, we got called on duty in Tracy at 8.45 a.m., on the uh, RVSJA and we had the 3207 and the 3208 and um, um, Larry wasn't feeling well when we we came to work and um, so he asked me if I would mind running the engine uh, running the train and at that time you know I was new it was like I was chomping at the bit anytime I could get a chance to to run I sure I want to run now, if I'm working with somebody else, yeah, you want to run, go ahead. You know, I just, <laughs> I've done it, you know, been there, done that. But it, I was young and, and, and needed the experience too. And Larry was uh, very tired and I think he was suffering from a very bad headache. So uh, he asked me if I wouldn't mind running and he'd sit in the fireman's seat. And um, Larry took a nap. Uh, we weren't supposed to do that, but that's okay. He needed a nap. And uh, I ran the train over to Niles and uh, Larry, uh, kind of woke up looking out the window when we were going by Niles and the train had work at Warm Springs Yard when we got down there we had to do some set out pickup I don't exactly remember the work and Roy was the conductor again because the whole crew stayed together for the we called it the Devil's Triangle you'd catch a trip in Oakland go to Tracy then go Tracy San Jose and then San Jose back to Oakland or they could send you back to Tracy again too if, if need be but um, Anyway, Larry took over, said he'd, he'd take the throttle back. And I remember, I asked him, I said, you sure you, you want to take the throttle back? No, no, I, I better do the work. I got a little more experience than you, and uh, I, I better do the work, you know? And I said, okay. So I got in the fireman's seat, and uh, we were coming in the Warm Springs, and I guess the, I don't know what the slack was like. I don't remember how many cars, but anyway, um, Larry was breaking the train for them to make the cut and the air went, which means the train brakes went in the emergency and it stopped before it was supposed to. And actually what happened is Larry screwed up on the train handling just slightly and it broke a knuckle. And I remember Roy was really ticked. Uh, the conductor, he came up to the engine. I don't remember what he said, but he started laying into me because he thought I had broke the train in two and that Larry jumped in the seat to make it look like 
he had done it, but Larry convinced Roy, he goes, no, no, he says, I, I did it. And Larry's a nice guy. He, he, he told the truth, you know, and, uh, and just uh, uh, said that, no, no, he had done it. So I, I, I remember that. I, that, that was uh, just one of those little railroad experiences. But we eventually got the, they carried the knuckle down there, got the train back together. The work was finished and uh, carried on. And actually we didn't do too bad because we still made it in the San Jose at 2.40 p.m. with the tie up and we were only on duty six hours and 10 minutes. But, uh, and you know, Larry, that as a fireman for that, I only got paid $60.70 for all that trouble for that whole day. So uh, pay scales have changed since then. A bee flew in the cab and it was on my, I had my jacket up there and it was on my jacket. I kept looking at it and I was shoving back to make a joint up there. And just as I was gonna make the joint, the bee buzzed my face and I went like this. And then Frank, remember Frank, oh, yeah. he says, that'll do, that'll do, that, that oh, oh my God, we just hit the building. <laughs> we did, I went like seven feet too far. There's a big hole in the building and it's all twisted up there in plastic. Did that? Yeah. yeah. The only time that I ever saw him get a little tingle of upset was when they, at the Davis when they, they ran his train up there, <laughs> up, up the branch, and he, he, he was a live wire that day. But other than that, I've never seen him uh, uh, upset or, and I, he wasn't really overly upset, uh, but he, he wasn't necessarily too pleasant though either. Yeah. Well, I worked up there, I had that position, that was a regular position for me. Again, the, the railroad gave me a lot of freedom, freedom that you don't get any place else. I had the insurance business for two years, and I worked in the uh, meat industry for maybe five or six years, all the time keeping my position with the railroad. So I went to Susun Fairfield as a, as a herder up there, allowing me to work nights and to uh, go out and sell and do what I had during the day, which I did. And I'm not so sure, the fellow that uh, threw the switch arrow, his name was Jim, I, that's his first name, I can't recall his last name. But nonetheless, we had specific instructions that when you went out to throw the main line switch, you didn't throw the main line switch, you started a clock and then you went down and got a second switch and then you walked back. But being, because of laziness and all that type of thing, you ought to communication, the guy's coming west with the train that's uh, going up the branch and you're to go out there and uh, st start the the, uh, the clock, as they called it, and line the switch and go down and get the second switch. But because uh, it was easier just to start the clock and go down and get the second switch and then walk back, that's what we did. Well, what had happened was that the communication wasn't that good in that. It was Jim's particular case and Larry. Larry, Jim did not loan. Larry was out there. The local was behind uh, the whoever was coming down the main and so Jim went out and threw the switch in front of Larry and the rat wound lined him up the branch. So uh, I can see it happening, but I mean, it, 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 uh, I, I, even today I think of, uh, the thank the Lord Jesus that I, I never did something like that because I had a, I did drink an awful lot. And when I went to work on something, was at the midnight shift. I, I always, I was out in the field. I went to all the bars during the day selling. I was selling in bars mostly. And when I got up there, I wasn't always too stable. <laughs> when I get up to Susu and Fairfield, you know, why anything could be possible. I mean, you know, but nonetheless, I, when I went up there, I only had to work maybe not more than an hour a night. Well, that, that, that would be a, a, a long time, but normally it was less than an hour, you know, lining the switches. And once the local was gone, your work was done. <laughs> To help understand the complexities of being the greatest engineer in the Western Hemisphere, the 54 Fan Club traveled all the way to Omaha, Nebraska to meet a very special lady. Um, I work for the Union Pacific in Omaha, Nebraska in the Harriman Dispatch Center. I'm a train dispatcher. <laughs> um, it's Elizabeth Ann Broderick. Um, there's, when we switched to CAD, there was already an EAB downstairs. So they just came to me one day and they said, you're going to be ELB. And I'm like, 
well, I go by Beth, can't I just be B-A-B? And they're like, no. <laughs> there was no negotiation about that. It was, I don't know how they came up with it. You know, the, uh, YL, I don't know. They're such nice guys. I, uh, I try and do my best to get them in and out. And, you know, I, uh, uh, they kind of, it seems like when I come in in the afternoons, they've kind of been relegated to the end of the line. It seems like getting out of Warm Springs usually, so. Um, on a good day, I know when I get there that they're already at Fremont, which rarely happens, you know. And on Wednesday, they've never usually made it out to Livermore by the time I get there. So, um, I don't know. I like talking to them, and I try and do my best by them. And uh, I don't know, I really, I really like them. I like the weird moves that they make. <laughs> it looks really pretty at Niles Junction and Digicon when they used to do that shuffle. It was like right in the dead bullseye center of, of all the screens, and it, it would like do this afterburn thing where where the train had been would be kind of yellow, and then they're red, and then it's darker green where they're going, and then lighter green where their path is going. It looked like a flower in the middle of, of Niles Junction. It was it's the best thing to watch, you know. But now we don't have that anymore, unfortunately. Tahoe at the Edgewood golf course. My dad was nervous. He was very, very nervous. His heart was racing. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. And um, all day long, he's like, I, I think I'm feeling a little bit better. I'm doing a little bit better. But he was extremely nervous. He looked fantastic. My dad's a handsome guy. And everybody always comments on how young he looks and he was pretty nervous, but he did he did pretty good. You know, he's nervous about everything, worrying. You know, he needs to stop doing less of that. <laughs> well, he's done a lot of kind things. He doesn't, he's not a guy that, you know, has the TV camera when he helps somebody out. He's not that uh, type of person. Um, he's, he likes kids a lot, and he likes his grandkids. Uh, he does a lot of things behind the scenes for them and his daughter. Um, he's not a guy that says, I did this and I did that. He's not one of those guys. You would never know. But um, he's done different things for people. He's a person that, um, that is willing to do, do things just for good, not out of bonus points or people say he's a nice guy. He just does not because he's good on the inside. That's why. And he's... He's really a good guy and certainly a much better person than I am, and I can say that because I know what he does. Well, the way, the way he treats people. He's friendly. He's, uh, for example, the other day, I've been having trouble with my eyes with this illness. He came over and cut my fingernails for me. I said, how about that, huh? Something like, things like that. And uh, his whole life has been to help people, you know, he's, he's had helped his mother, took care of his wonderful care of his mother until she got ill, you know, and he's wonderful, great guy. Walking around the engine with Larry the first day, I had we had to MU a couple of engines, and uh, he was taking me around, pointing things out, and I just did the uh, the tie up, and I was starting to link the uh, MU hoses together, and I had missed a valve on there, and it was like. You know, him putting his arm around me and taking me over and look, son, uh, you missed a, missed a valve over here. <laughs> so uh, I, I would say that was very positive. And, and in fact, he always kind of looked back on that, saying, you know, son, I love you like a son, but uh, let me show you this, let me show you that. But, uh. I grew up in Southern California, and uh, it was suggested to me if I would hire out switching, I could stay home and work and, and put myself through school. And so I did that to put myself through school. And 41 years later, I'm still railroading. Well, right now, Tom's with the uh, local right now. He's a le California legislative representative, and we work pretty closely about uh, taking tracks out of service, making sure things get fixed, the weed problems and things like that. And um, we always, uh, when we went over to the chocolate place, we always got chocolate. <laughs> well, Tom's the same way. Tom's easy to get along with. Uh, 
I had more seniority uh, and I had a bump and I chose to go breaking for Tom to keep him on the job because if I had bumped him then he wouldn't have been back on the job. So that shows how I respect Tom and working for him was absolutely effortless. Uh, it was a collaboration. Uh, he'd come in and say, here's what we have to do, you know, what do you think, what do I, here's what I think, and away we'd go. Um, but with both of them, there's never been a bad moment. Well, Tom has an affinity for animals, and we were at uh, US Jip one day, and there was this little kitten. When I came across, it was following Tom. He had been, been there ahead of me, and apparently its mother had abandoned it, and it was hungry. And it was just a squealing and a squeaking for something. And Tom wound up somehow going into Jip there and getting something to feed it. And then after work that night, Tom went back with a box and uh, adopted that cat. And uh, he's done that, he did that with a kitten down at Milpitas also. So Tom is an animal person and uh, he goes out of his way when he sees one that needs help. I actually met Tom in a bar in Portola on my birthday. Uh, I had kind of ended up somewhere that I hadn't really expected to end up and he gave me a ride home. I was back home visiting. I was living in Reno at the time. And uh, we just started talking and have been talking ever since. You know, it's funny. Growing up in a railroad town, my mother had always sworn that she just knew I would never marry a railroader because my father kind of had the local railroad bar until he retired. And my mother just knew I wasn't going to marry a railroader. And boy, did I surprise her. Um, I guess because I grew up in a railroad town and my half-brother was a, an engineer that it was just pretty much what I expected. Um, initially, he was on through freight, so he wasn't really home a lot. Um, I, I think it's probably kind of like people who are married to truck drivers. It's just, you know, you, you sort of rearrange your life to whatever schedule they have, and you just hope they're going to be home for Christmas and Thanksgiving and not on the road somewhere. I know it sounds simple and maybe even trite, but he is a good, decent human being that will do anything at all for people he cares about. And that really is the true core of who he is. He's just a good, good person. And then Tom came along. He was actually off for a while and uh, they had talked about him a lot. and. Uh, Finally, when I got on the job there, which was about uh, three months after uh, conductor's class, uh, all of a sudden Tom showed up one day in the shanty and says, oh, I'm the conductor on the 54. So I'd, I'd heard so many things about him. And uh, in fact, I was so overjoyed that uh, that day uh, we met, we went to uh, lunch together. I said, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I'd heard so many things about you. And they were all true. I mean, he was just tremendous as far as, almost like a father figure. Uh, just. Again, willing to sit down, take the time, and uh, show you the ropes. Because to me, railroading is an experience. You, you have to experience it. That uh, academic side of it is uh, tremendous, but it's nothing compared to uh, getting out there with someone who knows what they're doing and can teach you the ropes of switching and, and train, proper train building and proper train handling, all that. It, it's, it has to be experienced. And those were the people that, that set the positive tone for me as far as getting my railroad career off to on the right foot. He loves to read. He likes to fish, although we now officially call it boating, because it's just a whole lot more honest about the whole proposition. Um, he likes to be out on the water. He's really politically involved and aware. He's probably not as involved as he'd like to be because of his schedule, but he's definitely in touch with everything that's going on statewide and nationwide and I think he'd probably like to be a little more involved than he is now when he's retired and has the time to be. Four years as mayor and uh, in uh, my I was re-elected in 1982 to the council 
and uh, then when the when the council reorganized that time, then we we uh, had a lady that became mayor, and I was still on the council as a, a council member. And then my wife and I uh, uh, moved down to uh, the Bay Area in 1985. My term ran till '86, but I, I resigned my position in '85 with just you know actually a few months less than a year ago on it. Well, I'm going to quote the great uh, the great uh, Larry as I call him, Cameraman Larry, or the great Larry of Valenson. Um, he, he has another quote besides, you know, the train quote. He, he said um, that you're only young once, but you have the rest of your life to be immature. And so uh, I, I'm going to wish him that. Well, I hope that they're happy. I hope they, that they get to do the things they want to do. Um, that's what it's all about at this stage. Uh, you have the freedom to do the things that you couldn't do before. And I've seen people who didn't do that. And it's not, it's not a, a, as good as life could be. Um, so I hope that they use the time to do the things they want to do and, and to not do the things that they don't want to do. I find that some days I don't feel like doing very much and I'll pick up a book and read for a while. And I have that luxury, I never had that before. A funny thing about retirement, when I was uh, first promoted, I was number 208 on the engineer's seniority list in Oakland. I remember I was standing there looking at that list one day, and this old head was there. I forget who it was, and I said, geez, I said, I'm never going to be able to hold a job around here. And he said, oh, kid, don't worry about it. People quit, die, and retire, and you always gain seniority. So, and I guess he was right. We all get there. Uh, I wish them a uh, long life. I wish them uh, enjoyment. I know they will. Uh, they both have uh, interests uh, other than the railroad, and, and they'll make uh, good on whatever they, uh, they pursue. Uh, even if uh, Larry comes here or stays here and works around the city of Pleasanton and doing different things, uh, Tom uh, is always traveling, always going up to Portola and different things. And he's got a boat, so uh, I know they'll, they'll make the best of their, their uh, retirement and I, I do wish them well that's uh, those two guys I, I will miss tremendously but we will keep in touch and that's the best part that I I can think of is always uh, keeping that communications and knowing what they're doing and how they're doing is uh, is important to me but I'm glad I'm he needs to he needs to he's so young for 60 that he should not be putting in all these hours to be enjoying himself I'm gonna watch my kids <laughs> He's going to have fun. He's going to do, he's been thinking of all the things that he can do to still, you know, stay in Pleasanton, but I think he'll, he'll get more, he'll get back into the art again, take some classes. Long life and health, and uh, the rest comes, health is, is wealth. To me, uh, uh, everything else is, is immaterial. I mean, you can find if, if you didn't have enough money, like in my case, I said, if I didn't have enough to live on with the railroad retirement, then I'd get a paper route. I'd do something, but uh, as long as you have health, you can do a lot of things. You can travel or you can get another job if you want to, a part-time job. If you're bored, you can do whatever. You could be a school crossing guard, uh, as long as you have health. And that's the most important thing, and I wish health to those guys. Uh, and I, I hope they live to be 100 and I can go to their funeral. But, uh, that they don't miss the job very much and that they have a lot of other stuff to do. And um, they should come out to Omaha too so I can meet them. I, I doubt I'm ever going to get a road trip at this point. But Tom, uh, you know, it was really nice working with you. And, and Tom used to say something like um, when they were at, Car or at uh, Carpenter at a certain time, I would just start to light up all the lights when I felt like they were going to be turning around and coming home. And he'd see like, you're almost as good as Troy as that. We just looked up and the lights turned on and we were just about ready to go. So Tom, Larry, I don't get to talk to you very much, but I can always tell when there's another engineer on the 54, that they just don't do the shuffle quite as fast. <laughs> it's just like, when are they gonna move? Larry would have been on that signal, you know. They'll probably travel a little bit and uh, get a lovely house to take care of. And uh, that I don't know. I imagine they'll try to do a little traveling. And as you know, his daughter, and they're thinking of moving to uh, 
Utah. And whether it's going to take place soon or ever or what, I don't know. But they're thinking about it. And frankly, I hope he never moves to Utah. <laughs> I don't know how anybody could want to leave Pleasanton and move to Utah, but then that's none of my business. <laughs> I'm probably the finest locomotive engineer in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> I, I always like that. <laughs> um, I'm Elizabeth Ann Broderick, dispatcher 58. Well, Larry, this is Bill Burkett, and uh, it's uh, I guess it's been a good ride. So uh, I guess what they say on the UP is That'll do LRM 54. Okay, Larry, this is Froggy, and uh, that'll do on the 54. I'm Debbie Sandall, and that'll do 54. I'm Dr. B, and that'll do 54. Okay, Joseph Melikin, Southern Pacific, that'll do 54. I'm Katie Valenson, and that'll do 54. I am Paul Comperla, and that'll do 54. I'm Ken Elston. That's me. Local 54. Okay? This is A.W. Swinton and that'll do 54. I'm Ken and that'll do 54. I'm uh, Tim Cakebread and that'll do 54. I'm Vicki Applegate and that'll do 54. Well, I'm Tom Hervey and that'll do 54. I'm Frank Kemp and that'll do on the 54 local.